Um, so good morning, uh, Pastor Jesse. This morning we're going to be in John chapter 16. We're doing our scripture memory, so I hope you've been working on it. And so uh, Pastor Ellie, if you'll spot me, get it out, because we're going for it. So I think we got the slide up here, where, but it's just a bunch of dots anyways, uh, because uh, we're supposed to know it by this Sunday. So have you guys been working on it? I don't hear <laughs> Stacy. Good work, Stacy. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's, there we go. Yeah, so there we go. So I, we, I put a lot of help up here for you to practice it. And if you haven't done it yet, that's fine. Um, uh, but, but we're going to try to recite it. And if I mess it up, just, uh, just spot me. All right, Pastor Elliot? Uh, so here we go. So this is my commandment, that you love one another. Say it with me. Greater love has no one than this, that someone laid down their life for their friend. You are my friend if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servant, for a servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friend, for all that I have heard from my father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you, that you should go, and that you should bear fruit, and that your fruit should abide, so that whatever you ask the father in my name, he will give to you. These things I have commanded you, so that you will love one another. See, we did it. And if you haven't done it yet, keep working on it. Um, and it's, it's almost convicting when you sit down and just memorize scripture for a minute, two minutes, and just build on it little by little. And then before you know it, you've memorized seven verses. And it's like, wow, that's amazing. I should have been doing more of this in the past. So, hey, who's ever heard the saying, I've got good news and I've got bad news? A little bit, yes. Yeah. So that's what we're going to talk about today. I've got good news. And there's some old jokes. And if these are kind of PG-13, please forgive me. Um, uh, but so we got good news. We got a lot of them around the medical profession, right? So like there's, there's one that says, all right, I got good news, good news and bad news, uh, said the eye surgeon when he came in after the surgery and he turned to the, the patient and said, the good news is you're getting a new dog. You get it, right? Like some of the thing, yeah, so the bad news is that the surgery didn't go very well and you're going to be blind. A little bit, you with me? Like is that, <laughs> so, so all right, the good news is you're going to lose 50 pounds the bad news is it's in your legs. So, ah, no. okay, I asked some people if they thought this was appropriate, and they said it was okay. Um, but so these good news and bad news jokes, and we had one happen just this last week. Uh, <laughs> this is true. So those were just silly jokes that I Googled and found online. But this actually happened last week. And uh, <laughs> we were staying up at Dragon Hill Lodge last week because we had to go get some passports, which I know many of you have been to both places before up there. And uh, our appointment was at 9. And so we got up early, and we're grabbing a quick something to eat, and we had to print up an important document. Again, we're going to the embassy. And so I went to the n nice person at the desk. Uh, now, first of all, I mean, I just, so I'm a little mouthy sometimes. I confess, like I, sometimes my attitude gets the best of me, and that happens. So I, I went to the desk, and I said, hey, is your business center open? Because we got to print something up, and we have an appointment at the embassy. And the person, <laughs> the person at the desk said, well, yes, it is open. It, op it opened at 8 o'clock. I was like, great. And she said, but the people who go in there to open the door don't open it until nine. <laughs> that, and, I was, and I'm sorry, I'm just confessing to you this. Real, I said, oh, that's cool. Why don't you just say that it opens at 6 a.m.? As a matter of fact, why don't you just say it's open 24 hours all, every day, and then just the people who open it don't get here until nine. And then it's like, you know that meme of the like, Indian guy and the thing sitting there like looking like, like it's like I felt the Holy Spirit. <laughs> And I said, I'm sorry, I know it's not your policy, you know, um, I, I understand, thank you for giving me that information, and I know, you know, I, I essentially apologized and tried to not be rude, and, and, and to her credit, she printed up for us and helped us out, but the whole good news, bad news thing is what we're going to be talking about today, and we think about this on a more serious note, in line with the gospel, you know, the word gospel means good news, because for those who have Jesus, that means that this fallen world is temporary, it means that our sins have been paid for on the cross. And as long as we repent and follow Jesus, that one day we're going to be with him for all of eternity. That's good news. But for the world, that's bad news. For those who don't have Jesus, that means that they're going to be held accountable for their sins and their debt has not been paid. So the same thing that's good news for us is bad news for the world. So are we called to sit back and say, ha ha? No, we're called to love the world and to go into the world and to show them the love of Jesus Christ and to preach the truth. And that's what we're called to do. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. So here's the question that, that I have for you this morning is when in your life were you the happiest that you've ever been? When has your joy been full? I remember if you've, if you've spent time overseas in deployments, I just think of that moment when you get home 
and there's the buzz and you ride in the bus and you're going to a gym or some big place a lot of times and there's a hustle and a bustle and you can kind of see some of the kids and why you're trying to find your spouse and then like you stand in a formation and you're just like brimming, you know, and all of a sudden they're, they just say, fall out. And you can just, you just run and hug your wife and hug your kids. I get emotional thinking about it. Such a happy time, such a celebration. So our joy being full in that moment to be reunited with the ones that we love, the ones that we've been waiting so long to be with. And I think how, how much infinitely more incredible is it going to be when we see Jesus that day and we're reunited with him and we don't have to worry about that ever going away from us. That's the hope and the truth that we have in him. It's tough right now. The bad news is that he's not with us, but the good news is that we will be with him and we'll be with him for all of eternity as long as we have given him our hearts and repented and followed him for the rest of our time here on earth. So the big idea is this. Our temporary suffering in this world is to be endured as we have imminent eternal joy in Jesus. This good news is bad news to the lost and Jesus calls us to pray that God uses us to reach them. Our good news is terrible news for those who don't know Jesus. We need to reach them intentionally. We need to make sure that we are saying, Lord, where can you use the gifts? Where can you use the heart that you've changed and made new in me to reach them and show them your love? So we're gonna start here in verses 16 through 19. Verse 16 reads, and I know this is a, yeah, <laughs> that's my bad, I did, I did that. Um, but this is what the word of God reads in John chapter 16, verse 16 through 19. A little while and you will see me no longer. And again, a little while and you will see me. So some of his disciples said to one another, what is this that he says to us? A little while you will not see me. And again, a little while and you will see me. And because I am going to the father. So they were saying, what does he mean by a little while? We do not know what he is talking about. Jesus knew that they wanted to ask him. So he said to them, is this what you are asking yourselves? What I meant by saying a little while and you will not see me. And again, a little while and you will see me. Do you guys get all that? All right, you will see me, you won't see me. This is what, you know, here's the point. This is what we're gonna write down. And today, instead of doing just a normal write this down, we're gonna do this in the context of bad news and good news. All right, so here's, here's the write this down point, right? So the bad news is that we cannot see Jesus, but the good news is that this is part of his plan, right? It's not like he's in heaven trying to figure out what's next. Oh man, okay, how am I gonna do this? What's going on? Like he planned this long ago that he's gonna leave for a little while and eventually he's gonna come back and we're gonna be reunited for all of eternity. And this is a struggle that a lot of the world has today because they say, look, I would believe God if he would do this. If God would just show up and give me enough evidence, if God would just do what I want or act in a way or appear the way that I want him to appear, then I would follow him. And the word of God clearly answers that. A lot of them don't remember it, but first of all, it, it, or they don't know it, but Romans 2.15 says that the law of God is, is written on our heart. It's on, on all people's heart. Even, that's talking about unbelievers. So they have it in the heart first. Second, creation points to him. So we're all without excuse. That's Romans 1. That Romans 2 is built off of that Romans 1. And then Ecclesiastes even says that he has put eternity in our hearts. So what does all of this mean? It means that we do not have an excuse because ultimately it's not a head issue, it's a heart issue. Ultimately, the world just doesn't want to be accountable to somebody. And those of us who are believers still have our flesh and our flesh constantly is trying to battle with the new us, the new creation, and, 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 we, and we know this personally. And so when people say, hey, I, I, I believe God if he did this, it's like you have all the evidence that you need. There is, our, there's, we've talked about this before, but the world, you know, the, the, when you, when this, the more and more scientists study the universe, the more complex it is, and they make these assumptions and say, well, if we can see 13 billion light years away, we'll see the beginnings of the universe, and that will prove the Big Bang, and then they can finally see it, and it turns out that it's already developed there. So to us, that means that they don't know what they're talking about, and this grand universe is far more complex than science thinks, and then when they look at our cells, they see it's not like, like you know, Charles Darwin taught that, or he, uh, that he thought that our cells were very simple, and we could just get a few chemicals and mix them together, charge your electricity, and we can make life, and the more we look at DNA and find out about the cells and how complex, that all points to Jesus. So the takeaway is, again, it's not evidence, it's not knowledge, it's a heart issue that people don't want to be accountable to a Savior. And this is what Psalm 14.1 says, is the fool says in his heart that there is no God. In his heart, not in his head, 
that there is no... But the good news is, we see in Ezekiel 11, God can take, can take a heart of stone and he can turn it into a heart of flesh. That God can take the hardest of sinners and penetrate that and say, you know what you're looking for and it's me. And it's not just good news, it's the best news. And I can make you new if you will just trust me in this process. And then 2 Corinthians 5 reminds us that we're a new creation. This is the gospel, this is the good news. But again, it's bad news for those who refuse to submit, for those who refuse and want to do their own way, who say, I just don't see enough evidence, that I just don't see Jesus right now. But we just looked at it, this is part of Jesus' plan. That he left and he, we're here as his ambassadors, as his representatives. He didn't leave us alone. He sent the Holy Spirit, the comforter, the helper to guide us through this process. And so I just wonder, and again, I'm just speaking for Jesse McCullough, but I just wonder if sometimes it annoys God. Again, this is just me. Don't get too over nerdy theological on me. But that he gets questioned so much. Because if I tell you something, you're like, well, let me go verify that. You know, were you really over there? Because I'm going to go talk to him. Can I see the receipt for that purchase? Like, dude, it was, it was a three dollar donut, or whatever. <laughs> you know, like, just call, stop questioning my integrity that way. That we can trust God's promises, we can trust Him, and we should not uh, question His integrity. So here's just a free chicken tool you can take, you can throw it back, right? So it's just something that I want you to, to take from Pastor Jesse. So if people say to you sometimes, hey, I tried Christianity, and it just seemed like there was no evidence, or it was too closed-minded, or I just didn't like this, I just didn't like this, I just say to you, Christian, I mean this in love, stop being the weak person in this scenario. Or, because people say, well, I tried Christianity, and bashful Christians say, oh, that's, that's cool, that's neat that you tried you know, so that, we're not called to be weak. We're called to have our confidence and our strength in Jesus Christ. And so sometimes you say, oh, that's neat. That's cool. But, you know, it's funny because I tried living for myself and I just found out that it's empty and annoying. And I found hope and strength and meaning and purpose. And I'm a new creation because of Jesus Christ. So when people say that, well, I tried the church. Well, I tried what you're doing, too. And it sucks. It stinks. It stinks. <laughs> it, it's rough. I had a hard time. But the good news is that there's nothing special about me. And the hope that I have in Christ is available to you. It's available to all of us. So when someone says, I tried Christianity, we should say, but you didn't try Jesus. You tried an institution, but you didn't try a savior. And that's what we need to do is we need to be pointing people to the foot of the cross because that's what he's called us to do. So that's just the free chicken. I hope you eat it and I hope it's delicious. <laughs> so, so how long will he been gone? He says here for a little while. He says, I'm be gone for a little while. What does that mean? Well, first of all, remember, he's not gone figuring it out. He's not in heaven trying to say, okay, let's see, let's, let's do some military decision process, right? Like, like sit down and get some koas and have the, you know, have the God the Father come in and maybe choose the best koa and everything. No, he knows this is all part of what he's doing, but he says here a little while. And there's other times he talks about this, even in the Gospel of John, 733, I'll be with you a little longer, 1235, the light is among you for a little while longer. You guys can see the slide up here, 1333, yet a little while, 149, yet a little while. So again, he's saying, hey, a little while I'll be here and I'm leaving. You shouldn't be surprised. It's going to be rough and it's going to be difficult, but take heart because guess what? I've overcome the world. It is going to be difficult. We're going to have sorrow. But again, it's part of his plan. And the cross models that. What other leader does this? What other leader actually said, hey, I'm going to leave early, but I'm going to come back in glory? Nobody, military, religious, whatever, nobody has let themselves go and said, I'm going to leave for a little while and come back in glory. It's just another example of how Jesus Christ is the King of kings and he is the Lord of lords. All right, so... The point of all of this is that we, can, we, we cannot see Jesus now, but this is part of his plan. So verse 20, truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn into joy. When a woman is giving birth, she has sorrow because her hour has come. But when she has delivered the baby, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been born into the world. So here's the bad news. The world has fake joy now. The good news is that Christians have real joy forever. Bad news, the world has fake joy now. The good news is that Christians have real joy 
forever. So, so what's this fake joy? It's that mocking arrogance that gets under the, our skin. It's, I'm just being real with you, okay, God? It, just, it can be annoying when people mock us because we're people too, and it hurts. Our, and it's, it's sorrow, and it's frustrating. We want our sense of justice to say, well, you'll see. One day God's going to get you, and that's, that's the devil getting a foothold right there. What we need to do is pray and say, Lord, change their heart. Change their desire. Help me to reach them in a way where you can impact them and change them so that we're not divided, so that we're united. But this fake joy can be really frustrating as we see people boasting in the very sin that is leading them to their destruction. They're on a boat that's sinking, and it's like they're making fun of the people on the one that's floating. <laughs> it just, it's silly, and it's backwards, and it makes no sense. See, see we're, we're sad because Jesus isn't here, but again, we know that this is temporary. And maybe you saw the picture in the beginning, but you remember the, the Disney movie Inside Out? And you remember sorrow and joy, sadness, I think her name was, and, and, and how that worked back and forth because in order to have joy be able to be properly expressed, you had to have times where sadness was there too. They worked back and forth. What a great example of the gospel in this world and the next. How we're going to have sorrow here and it's going to be difficult and we're going to struggle. But as we go through that, we have joy that's eternal and it'll be perfect and we never have to worry about pain or suffering or anything else again. Romans 8.18 says, I consider the sufferings of this present time not worthy to be compared with the glory that will be revealed to us. This pain is going to be worth it. Just like childbirth. They forget. And if you guys don't know this, Agape knows a little something about childbirth. Holy moly, we had a lot of babies to be born. <laughs> and I praise God. You know, we have, uh, let's see, the Kings, the Crumbs, uh, the Dysons, the Pre Preston and Bethany Williamsons, uh, and then I think the Star, just so many, and if I forgot, I'm sorry, but the babies being born and ladies know firsthand the pain, but then the joy, that is worth it. And we praise God that he's given us that example that, that, uh, of something being Worth it. The word lamentation is used here, which is normally associated with repentance. Repentance is not just being sorrow, but it's the idea of, Lord, I'm sorry that I messed up. I lament, and I will do my best to not do that today. But we look around us, and we see the world rejoice in thinking that in their, in their ignorance and their arrogance that they're going to win. And we live in a unique time with the technology and the social media and all this stuff, and it just feeds into all of that. And it makes it more and more difficult, and it brings us unique challenges. And the devil is driving that and saying that, hey, Christians, stop worrying about the gospel. Stop worrying about loving people. And instead, start worrying about politics. Don't worry about loving your neighbor, but, voting, but, but worry about voting for the right person. That's a lie from the devil. You love your neighbor as yourself. You do what Jesus commanded you to do. Yes, we have a responsibility to do certain things, but if that's taking place of the gospel, then you, my friend, are a sinner. And you need to get that right. Are you guys with me this morning? It's just we need to make sure that our priorities stay in fulfilling the gospel of Jesus Christ and loving our neighbor as ourself. That's what he calls us to do. Social media. And this is old people, too. I know some of, the, some of my senior saints out there <laughs> sitting there like, yeah, that's right, young people on the social media and the cell phones. You know, the, my dad, is, I, my, he's watching. Love you, dad. He's on Facebook all the time. That's, this stuff has an influence on us. There's actually an article on the Gospel Coalition several months ago, but it, was, it said, Facebook killed my mother. And it didn't mean physically killed, but basically the point of the article was that this lady didn't know her senior citizen aged mother anymore because a few years ago she was a sweet, kind Christian lady who loved Jesus, and then she started getting the algorithm that started manipulating her fears, and she got to where she went from this nice lady to where, oh no, the, the vaccine is going to put a chip in all of us for the Antichrist, and you can't trust the government, and just became this huge conspiracy theorist because of all these simple articles that manipulated her thoughts. All because of so, it's manipulating us and we don't even realize. Am I telling you that social media is a sin? No, but I'm saying it can be, just like anything can be a sin if it messes up your relationship with the Lord. We have to just understand the influence that this can have on us. And there's some statistics, I think, that shows this in a book that, uh, that written by Kinnaman. He says this, 26% of teenagers think that they will definitely or probably be famous by the age of 25. And that's just not realistic. I'm sorry, teenager, if you think you're, like, you're going to be a K-pop star or whatever. Maybe you're like the 0.001%, but I'm just saying, pray, really pray about that. Seek, <laughs> seek the Lord, because that's why America needs Simon Cowell. If I wrote a book, that's what I would call it. 
America needs Simon Cowell because some of you guys need to be told that you sound like a dog and dying when you try to sing. So I mean that in love. So I'm just, <laughs> so some more statistics, 20% of adults are unhappy with their lives because of loneliness. So 60 million people, that's 60 million people in America sit around and are just chronically, critically unhappy and, and, unlo and they are lonely. Another one, more teens, listen to this one. This is more factual, not statistic, but it's a testimony to the influence that social media has on our thinking. More teens believe it is worse to not recycle than to view pornography. More teens believe it is worse to not recycle than to view pornography. Do you think that that mind, has, that heart has not been skewed and influenced by all the subtle little changes and the videos and things they watch online? Absolutely. And that's how the devil works. He's subtle. The world creeps in, and next thing you know, you're getting mad at God and saying, this is unfair. Why don't you do this, Lord? Why don't you do that? What a position of arrogance. We trust the Lord and know that his plan is correct. And we have to be aware of what the devil is doing through social media, through news networks, and all of these other things. Jaron Lanier says that social media is continuous behavior modification. It's on a mass basis with everyone receiving calculated stimulus to modify them. It's a bad religion. It's a nerdy, empty, sterile, ugly, useless religion that is based on false ideas. We need to make sure we understand, again, it's not a sin. You just have to make sure that you're honoring God with it. And because that's how the world sneaks in. That's how the world has that fake joy. Everyone looks so happy on social media, but we know that's just not real. And it can become ultimately self-worship. And so we just have to give this to Jesus and say, Lord, how do you want me to honor you with this? And as the world tries to look so happy on social media, we have to know that, Lord, they are in desperate need of you. And please give me the heart. Please give me the desire. Please use me in a way that can glorify you so that I can reach them. But the point here is that in Christ, we have eternal joy, not empty, fake joy of the world. Verse 22, so also you have sorrow now, but I will see you again, and your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take your joy from you. So we write this down. The bad news is the believer's joy will be attacked. The good news is that our joy is in the victory of Jesus. See, our joy is eternal. It's forever. No one can take it away. When God makes a promise, guess what? You can count on it. It is 100% going to happen. It's not up for negotiation. No one can take that joy away. And then secondly, it will be complete. It is absolute. It is amazing of the mountaintop moments that God blesses us with here. Moments of worship, like we had a little, I just, I'm so thankful for our praise and worship team and our AV team and everybody who makes that possible. And these great moments of worship, they could pale in comparison with the joy that we will have in eternity with him for those who know him and love him and have been redeemed. That's the completeness that we'll have in him. But here on this earth, believers were under attack. The, the world has this fakeness going on and they're lying and they're trying to destroy people because ultimately the world doesn't want to be reminded that it's lost. Did you know that, Christian? If you're walking around showing the fruit of the Spirit, treating people the way Jesus called you to, to treat people, people are going to attack that because you remind them of the way they're supposed to live. So essentially when they reject you, they're rejecting Jesus. But what does Jesus, how does Jesus respond to that? He loves them. He shows them grace. He shows them mercy. And guess what? We're called to do the same. Even in the midst, because a lot of times it's those who are outspoken the most that maybe the Spirit's really working on. And they have to constantly say, rah, 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 you know, and act like they're so angry and proud of the ultimate. Say, Lord, help that person to find you and help me to be the tool which you use to find them. You guys, what, does that make sense? All right. So it's just, it's important that we understand um, God's plan and his will and, and, and where he has us going in life. Uh, and, and so the, the eternal joy that we have only in him. So our sorrow will turn into joy. We know that whatever we go through here on earth, we're going to forget about because one day we're going to be with Jesus. All of this sorrow is in accordance with God's will. And of course, we miss Jesus. I mean, have you ever said like the little kind of sideline prayer, like, look, Jesus, <laughs> if you just come like appear to me right now, like I won't tell anybody. <laughs> like if you just if you're just quiet with me, it's okay. I just want to get my doubts of re you know nothing wrong with that, right? So no, I don't think there's anything wrong with it, but that's not God's plan. I do believe He appears. If you read accounts from like the especially Muslim influence world, Jesus is in dreams and He's doing things, and so it's not a physical appearance. That's not going to be until He comes back. But He is doing mighty things all around this world today, and it's important that we remember that. However, this again is part of His plan that He leaves, and the world tries to look so proud but it's all fake. It's 
it's all fake. There's a book that I got familiar with by, written by a Hollywood psychologist who basically treats a bunch of the biggest stars in Hollywood, and the point is basically how empty they are inside. All the money, all the good looks, all the party lifestyle, everything you could basically want that this world has to offer, and they are empty and suicidal and depressed and on chronic medication, everything because they don't have Jesus. They believe the lie, and they've gotten to the logical end of the lie, and they found it empty. Again, because joy is only in Jesus Christ. Because the, the, the sorrow that we have here on earth is temporary, but their sorrow, if they don't know him, is going to be eternal. So the point of this is that our joy in Jesus is guaranteed despite the world. Verse 23, in that day you will ask nothing of me. Truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Until now you have asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. So write this down. Bad news, our joy here wavers. We're gonna have good and bad days. The good news, Jesus desires to refresh our joy through answered prayer. So as our joy goes up and down, that's something that helps us walk with Jesus. You know, believe it or not, trials can be a good thing in the sense that it reminds us that we need to turn to him every day. Sometimes when I don't feel very good physically, it reminds me that maybe I need to go exercise and stop eating so many donuts. <laughs> and that's exactly what happens spiritually. Jesus desires that this joy going up and down reminds us that we need to go to him and be refreshed. The disciples have been learning from Jesus. They've been praying to God. They've been trusting him. And, and, and just similar to how the way that we're called to, to follow him and trust him and understand there are going to be ups and downs. We're called to have a relationship with him, understanding that he is God and we are not. Verse 23, where Jesus says that, ask nothing of me. This means that one day we're going to have the fullness of knowledge. So when he says, ask nothing of me, it means we're going to have everything. It's not going to need to click anymore. When we're with him in all of eternity, we'll have all of our questions answered so that we'll ask nothing of him in that day. Does that make, that's an important key that I think a lot of people miss in this text. And I hope that you understand it because just like the world has lies and when if you know Jesus and you first heard the gospel and the Holy Spirit touched your heart, you said, this is it. This makes sense. This is the answers and the truth that I've been looking for. The same thing times infinity will be in heaven where you say, ah, this is it. This is what I was created for. This is the relationship and the life and the existence that I'm supposed to have. That one day we're going to have that and it's in him. And then nothing can take that away. So the ups and downs of this world are going to happen. But one day for those who know Jesus, we'll be with him for all of eternity and we'll say, ah, this is it. But until then, God has designed us to be in prayer, to treasure prayer, to understand. But I love this idea of the, the knowledge, right? Of the, okay, we're going to know everything. Because now, Christians, we can know a lot. But a good example, and follow me on this, because I think, if anything, I just want to vent a little bit. But, so this knowledge that we have, it's like, have you ever gone to McDonald's? And, and if, first of all, if you say, no, you're a dirty liar. Uh, <laughs> Jesus loves you. Uh, but... <laughs> Have you ever gone to McDonald's and someone gets up to the counter and they're like, hmm, now what do you have now? What is that, a cheeseburger? It's like, you're, you're at McDonald's. They have cheeseburgers, they have nuggets, they have fries. Order your food, bro. Like it's not, you know, like you know what it is they have. Don't act surprised. Your knowledge is full. Act accordingly, right? So one day our knowledge is going to be in, like an eternity full, but here on earth it's not eternally full. So, but 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 we we anticipate knowing that it will be one day, just like that person should have anticipated what they were supposed to order at McDonald's. Are you with me? I really wanted to get that in there, so <laughs> I hope I hope that it worked. Um, but. Our joy wavers, and we're called to do what? We're called to pray. Jesus designed it. He said, hey, whatever you ask the Father in my name. It's not praying as an obligation or a dead requirement, but it's praying in a way that's a desperate plea to God to say, Lord, this world is so empty. They try to look so happy, but it's all so fake. Use me as a conduit to touch their lives, Father. Help me to love them the way that you loved me. It's not a Lord, please help them. That's better than nothing, but we should be passionate and fired up about sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. John Gerard said that prayer is the key to heaven's treasures. But there's an acronym here that I want to look at real quickly. It's by a guy named Chuck Lawless. He said, a lot of people just don't know how to pray for believers to pray, how to witness. And so the acronym here is God's heart. 
And this is just good specific, this is just a tool you can use or you can throw it away. Uh, but it's just a good specific thing, way that you can pray specifically for people and for yourself in your life. G, grace, pray that believers appreciate God's grace, O, obedient, that we're obedient to ask people and to show people to fulfill the Great Commission. D, desire, pray that believers will have a desire to tell others. Have you ever prayed for that? I'm not trying to make you feel bad. Have you ever prayed that God would light a fire in Agape and the other chapels here on Camp Humphreys for those who know Jesus, that God would light a fire to give us the desire to reach Camp Humphreys? A lot of times we're too worried about how we feel today and we're not worried about reaching Camp Humphreys. Lord, forgive us. We're gonna talk about that in a second. S, speak. Pray that believers will speak the gospel. Next slide, please. We get to the heart and it talks about non-believers, just praying that non-believers will have a receptive heart E, that, that their spiritual eyes will be open because we know that, that many have been blinded by the devil and by the world. They have an attitude, that, that they would have God's attitude towards sin, which is a big deal. Uh, that God would release them, and that, that they would be transformed. So as we pray for all of them, once they do accept Jesus, this is just kind of a free chicken thing, but pray for new believers as well. Pray that they would not be choked out. Pray that they wouldn't be burned up, but pray that their roots would become deep. And there's another slide. I, this is good. I, I hope you take it. Uh, but but let, just think about this. That take your prayer life, your, the things that you prayed for last week, or your prayer list, and just put everything into one of two categories. Put it either into mission or comfort. So is what we're focusing on in prayer lined up with God's mission and his glory and his goodness, or is it lined up with making me feel better? And some examples would be that the way we should pray is, Lord, I'm injured. May I honor you with this injury instead of, Lord, help my leg feel better. I help my sorrow to show your strength instead of help me be happy. Or help this task to bring you glory instead of help me graduate. Or... Help me find a way to share the gospel instead of keep me from that awful person. That's tough, especially when people get under your skin and they're doing that fake world rejoicing. Oh, that's cool. You're missing out. We're having so much fun over here. Yeah, you know you're not. You might have fun for a moment, but then you see that it's empty and you're empty inside. You need Jesus. But instead of gloating in that, still we're called to love people. But the point here is this, that, that uh here on life, our joy wavers, and we have ups and downs, but eternity, it never will. And that's the promise that we have in Jesus Christ. So earlier, we asked the question as we begin to wrap up, what is the happiest that you have ever been in this life? What is the happiest you've ever been in this life? What did that look like? Was your joy full? Because everything the world has to offer, listen, agape, Whatever you're struggling with, whatever temptation Satan is throwing your way pales in comparison. It's not even close. It's zero, it's negative versus infinity. The joy that we have in Jesus, the peace, the hope, the happiness, the life, the way that we were created to live it, that we have not because we deserve it, but because of God's grace, he offers it through the cross. That is the way we're called to live. That full joy. So get rid of the sin you're struggling with and trust God's plan. Even though he's gone for a little while, we know he's going to come back. Until then, love people the way that he's called us to love them. Pray for people in Jesus' name the way that he calls us to pray for them. And then in summary here, we see these bad news and good news. First of all, bad news, we can't see Jesus. Secondly, this is part of his plan. The world has fake joy now. Christians have real joy forever. Believer's joy will be attacked. Our joy is in the victory of Jesus. The victory is already won. And then finally here, our joy here wavers, but Jesus desires to refresh our joy through answered prayer. May we have our hope in the cross, knowing that our temporary sorrow in missing him will completely be replaced with the joy that is found only in him. And until that day, may we show the world his love and his truth until we get to be with him for all of eternity. Please pray with me. Lord, we thank you for the hope that we have only in you. We thank you for the offer of repentance and forgiveness that we have only in you. Lord, for those here who don't know you this morning, I pray that they would be touched by your Holy Spirit in a way that they know that it's you, Lord, that, they, that you love them, that you sent Jesus Christ to go to the cross to die for them. Lord, for believers here who are struggling with sin, Lord, may they know that you offer forgiveness, that you paid the debt for that, but, they, but may they see, may we see the poison, the effect that it is having on our life. May we know that only restoration and forgiveness is in Jesus. 
And Lord, until we're with you for all of eternity, help us to show the world your faithfulness and your goodness, despite how they treat us, Lord, even as they rejoice as they're dying, Lord, may we love them, showing them, Father, that true joy is found only in you, Jesus. We thank you for offering true joy and hope, and it's in the name of Jesus Christ that we do pray. Amen. Let us stand up and worship. All my words fall short. I've got nothing new. How could I express all my gratitude? Worthy of it all. You are worthy of it all. 
have it all for from you are all things and to you are all things you deserve the glory We like to recite the Great Commission together. So are you ready? The slide's not up there, but I bet we can do it. You ready? Go therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Matthew 28, 19, and 20. Go in peace, but stay for the baptisms. 